and welcome to Get the Table, another wrestling roundtable discussion podcast with myself, Adam Wilborn, Andy Murray, and Adam Cleary from What Culture Wrestling here to discuss another burning wrestling issue. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts where we review Raw, SmackDown, the Wednesday night war between NXT and AEW, pay per views, we have interviews, more roundtable discussions like this one, and a roundup of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. But, gents, we are gathered here today... In the sight of holy God. ...to discuss SmackDown's Fox TV deal and the disturbing mm. truth behind it. Uh, and the catalyst for all this was an article you wrote, uh, Andy Murray, for whatculture.com. I've heard of them, yeah. Because of... <laughs> Of course, MVD here. a lot of people are talking about it. We are just a few weeks away from SmackDown on Fox, and it's going to earn them a lot of money. Yeah, a billion dollars over five years. It's, um, I think it's the biggest TV deal in wrestling history. It must be, must surely. Be. Yeah. Um, WWE's entire business plan for the whole next X amount of years is totally based on this and the money they're going to receive. It's going to propel them to record levels of revenue and profitability, and it's going to... If it sticks out, it's going to do all these great things for the company and take them to a level they have never been at before, despite the viewership continually sinking for the best part of two decades. It's a remarkable bit of business, you, provided you said, they see it to the yeah, end. I was going to say, you, sh- you said in the article, you know, that WWE have already future-proofed themselves, but this is... Scrooge McDuck levels. Yeah, this is proofing. proper Scrooge McDuck. And while it's kind of inconceivable that WWE will ever go out of business, so robust is the system mm. that they've put in place. They are really, really good. They're not good at growing their audience. We can see that from viewership no. numbers. They are really good, however, at squeezing every single cent from every single fan. That's what they excel at. George Barrios, uh, Vince McMahon, they have built a really robust system. But... Getting this Fox deal right is absolutely imperative, and it's not as watertight as a lot of people think. Yeah, I suppose a lot of people have heard this, and, you know, it's a TV deal that stretches, oh, I can't remember how long, however long it stretches five, for. Five years. Five years. Um, but it's not like on night one they just sign a check and say, here's one billion dollars. It's whatever, two billion dollars or whatever it is. It's exactly. a progressive deal. Why could it be in trouble then? Well, like any uh, TV contract, TV shows, if they're not doing that well, can be cancelled. Um, December 2018, I think it was Dave who reported that Fox were going to look for a viewership average every week of somewhere in the region of 3.3 million. Now, given that SmackDown currently does around about two yeah. on USA, that's you know that's a huge uptake. It's uh, it's ridiculous. It's more than 50%. Um, the thing about all of this is that Got some numbers here, courtesy of Matt McEwen, used to appear on the DKP podcast. Dug up some numbers here, and roughly at the moment, SmackDown does, you know, it's got about a 2% audience share on USA Network. Of the people that have the USA Network in their homes, 2% watch SmackDown, so roughly 2 million. Um, When they move to Fox, bigger network available in more homes. If you use the same ratio, that goes up to 2.5. So that's an increase, obviously, but it's still a lot below the 3.3 million. Now, if they do get this 2.5 million every week, and, you know, we have to acknowledge that the first few weeks will be really high. Yeah, yeah. And then it'll taper off. You know, they got a draft. Uh, there's uh, some anniversary stuff going on, I think, on the first episode. And, of course, it's the first episode. People are going to want to see that. Yeah, they're branding it as a season premiere, yeah. both for Raw and SmackDown. It, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so, you know, there will be a boost, but it will taper off. And if it tapers off at $2.5 million, and now this is where it gets a little bit worrying. So in, this would be the 150th most watched cable show in the country. Last year, the 150th most watched cable show in the company was a Fox sitcom on the same same network, obviously, called Rel. Classic. It was it was cancelled after 12 episodes because it was only doing 2.5 million. I wouldn't imagine they spent a billion dollars on Rel for five years as well as the problem. <laughs> well, the, we, we've got all kinds of stuff to dive into, but the next Fox show up the rankings was another show called The Gifted, 3.32 million. So cancelled. Above, above what they want for SmackDown. Yeah, above what they want for SmackDown, cancelled. Now, caveats. There are always yep, yep. asterisks to this. Uh, SmackDown is being presented as a sports show. And sports 
events and shows and whatever, advertising revenue is a lot higher than mm. for your run-of-the-mill sitcom or whatever the heck the gift it was. Now, is that because they can sponsor more things? Pretty much, yeah. Um, you know, we've seen, we see it on WWE television all the time when the screen goes into a little corner and there's an advertisement mm. for Snickers or whatever. They can spread stuff all throughout the show. They can have product placement. You watch an NFL game and, you know, I'm no expert on American sports, but every time I've sat down to watch one or an NBA game, there's advertisements all over the the place. Yeah. It's like, here's the play of the night sponsored by mm. Jimmy Ping's taco stand or whatever. Yeah, it's, whenever, it's when, crazy. I'm, whenever I'm watching MMA and they go like, here's the corner cam presented by Corn Nuts or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of crazy, but you know, like this thing isn't cast iron. WWE aren't guaranteed a million, a uh, billion dollars, sorry. And basically, what has to happen for this thing to succeed, for them to reap the full benefits for them to get this million, the billion dollars that their business, their whole business strategy for the next half decade is based on, they've suddenly got to solve an 18 year problem, mm. that being chronically declining ratings. So it's an interesting the problem position with, to The be problem with in. that is they spent the last three years trying everything mm. to reverse ratings. They've got more legends in, they've got less legends in, they've tried <coughs> scripting promos tightly, they've tried giving people a bit more creative freedom, they've tried everything, but they seem to only try it for a week or two at most, and yes. then go, oh, that didn't work. And I would genuinely love to see if there's any American TV experts out there who can show us any example of any TV show ever jumping 60% of its own audience back in a heartbeat because, I don't know, they introduced Poochie or something like that. <laughs> I don't think there's probably any example of this. As you say, though, the interesting thing is, we know ourselves from doing YouTube, certain things are, certain, are more appealing to advertisers. I would imagine the kind of money you can make off sponsorships and whatnot from anything that's presented as a sports show, as we've said, is greatly, greatly increased. And I'm sure there's probably even a bit of merchandising in there as well. Any T-shirt any sold at WWE shop during that broadcast, a percentage might go to Fox. The ability for them to make money off this is probably what they've spent that billion on. But at the same time, it, it's not guaranteed at all that any of this is going to be successful it looks like it's going to be so perilous for wwe yeah. i think genuinely i think they're probably expecting oh we'll get on fox it'll be exciting there'll be a rebrand we'll redraft it and then profit so, yeah, i was gonna say is the, yeah. is the question yeah. mark bullet point there in there somewhere do you think smackdown can match fox's expectations of course it can because we know we know fine well that when wwe is good it's really 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 good and they've lost so many fans but every single one of those fans they've lost is a wrestling fan you know what I mean? They are there to be got back. They're there to be rescued. They're there to be given a reason to watch a product again. We've always said, even when we dump all over what they do, we don't want to do that. No. We want to sit here and go, wasn't Raw great? Wasn't SmackDown mm -hmm. brilliant? Aren't you excited for this pay-per-view? It's just that this malaise that has gripped the company for so long makes it really difficult to do that. If they just start booking a more enticing product, making better use of their stars, putting together better matches with better storylines, they will come. Like that's The audience will be there. The, the potential for it's probably closer to five or six, realistically, if they get their act it's together the in the next couple of years. Huge, but yeah. huge audience on Fox. Yeah. That's what Fox will have paid the money for. They know that there is a potential wrestling audience out there. That is huge. Yeah. And it's got to be said as well that Fox have not just said, welcome to the network, here's a billion dollars, get three million. They have rolled out the blue carpet, as they yeah, said. Yeah, like, I mean, we're now at a point where if this thing fails, it will be nothing to do with Fox, and it'll be entirely on yeah, WWE. Bro. Ray Mysterio's hanging out at NFL games. Braun Strowman's at baseball games. Getting... I saw Taker make an entrance on something. That yeah, the, like, these guys are all over the place. The advertisements, they're spread throughout all these sports broadcasts and stuff. Fox are giving this a real, real chance. There are a couple of things that give me pause about SmackDown's chances of hitting these targets. The first is that while TV in general, I think, has been really good over the past past few months. Raw has probably demonstrated more stark improvements, mm -hmm. and a lot of these have been yes. attributed to Paul Heyman. Yep. SmackDown's been good. It has improved a little bit, but it's not seen the same kind of jump. You still get, you know, the odd lashings of mediocrity throughout SmackDown, as you always will on a WWE show, because it's a variety show. But Paul Heyman's nowhere near SmackDown, and that gives me a little bit of pause. It's still ran by effectively the same team. Eric Bischoff is there, but his, min his creative input is supposedly minimal. I don't know if that team who's been working this way for decades can deliver the kind of creative changes that we've just spoken about. The second thing that gives me pause is I would absolutely love to see any, w any wrestling show. I'd love to see NXT, AEW do 
crazy numbers, double your ratings by the end of the year. It'd be amazing. It'd be All fantastic. wrestling journalists say that, don't they? I distinctly yeah. remember Brian Alvarez saying this years ago when he was dumping on Impact, saying, yeah. I don't want it to do poorly because everyone does better when wrestling does well. Our you... livelihoods are linked to this. Yeah. Like, I, I know we always get like, oh, hey, WWE. Genuinely, if WWE was the biggest thing in the world, we would be a bigger company and we would make more money. <laughs> you, want, like, yeah. you want everything to succeed. Even just as a fan, it's more exciting yeah. when things are doing really well. But, I worry that wrestling is now so far removed from the zeitgeist. Mm. That was Attitude Era 20 years ago that it can never return. Uh, pop culture movements tend to not do that. They don't tend to be the cool thing, go out of fashion, and then come back in in terms of TV show, arts, entertainment, and so forth. I think that wrestling's image now is too kind of, you know, set in stone. It is what it is. Uh, Fans love it, whatever. How do you sell this weird, wacky world to people who've maybe been brought up thinking it's fake and rubbish and nonsense? And especially because WWE have made it made it patently obvious that they are targeting, you know, the hardcore of the hardcore. Mm, yeah. They go, oh, sod it. We don't need to have a proper finish on this pay-per-view. We'll just do it on the next pay-per-view because you're only paying for the network yeah. and you're, already, you're guaranteed to be still paying for this next month. So what does it matter? There's no, you know, all I see when, you know, I go back and watch old episodes of, of Raw or SmackDown or whatever is people in the comment section saying, oh, you know, this is when it was good. This is when, you know, the whole show was kind of, one thing yeah. it was never make sure you join us next week for that there was teasing it yeah. was you know forward selling of stuff but it was always wrapped up with a nice bow at the end of the night Vince McMahon despite his dastardly ways was going to get a stone cold stunner or whatever is that what they need to return to or is it, is it just a different age now and they need to I don't, I don't think I know people sort of lament the lack of an edge to the product and go oh, what about the attitude here and all that but I don't think that's been a viable way for them to go for no. a long time moving into Agreed. the moving into the PG market getting more children involved you know the whole John Cena thing was it was genius from a business perspective it opened up the company to an entire new source of revenue it opened the company to an entire new audience it reframed the entire production of it in a way that took it into a more modern era it's just and i think we're going to probably see this with AEW their teething problems so far have been where that balance is mm. they've got a lot of criticism i think they probably thought the Cody Sean Spears chair thing would be a no pun intended, a big hit. And yet people are like, don't even want to see that anymore. The blood stuff's been a bit controversial. Vince McMahon even caught, even directly called them out for it on a conference call by calling it that, that gory crap, crap or whatever yeah. it was. I think simply putting an edge back on the product is a very simplistic way of saying they can fix it. It will help. It'll get a lot more people interested. People will be like, yes, because yeah. there is that bloodlust they need to satisfy. But at the same time, simply going back to Vince McMahon getting a Stone Cold Stunner at the end of every <laughs> night is not what's yeah. going to get 60% of the audience back. Like we've said, though, SmackDown has produced some quality in-ring content for a good six months to a year now. Like you say, Raw has, sh has shown the way for the direction they should go in, and it's been kind of up and down on SmackDown. Last week's was good. You know, previous weeks has, have been kind of up and down. It's it's important that they discover what is input, what is key for them. And arguably, one of the biggest things for them could well be Brock Lesnar. Yeah, I mean, Brock's absolutely huge physically and every other way. Um, he's a big purple bastard. He is the biggest male star in the company. Um, the, pro the thing they have with Brock is that he's one of, what, two or three proven draws. It's him and Ronda Rousey. There's mm -hmm. not really anyone else anymore. Like, if you look at numbers, they largely just kind of stay the same, regardless on who's on top. Uh, they stay the same or decline, uh, I should say. The, the thing with Brock is that the reason, and I know a lot of people hate the part-time schedule, and those are valid complaints. We discussed this a bit on mm -hmm. the news this morning. The problem with Brock is that what makes him special is that part-time schedule. It's the fact that you don't see him all the time so that when he shows mm -hmm. up, you know something big's going to happen. And it's a real source of appeal for one of the very few wrestlers who hasn't been overexposed by appearing on TV every single week. But... He's also the biggest guy in the company. He's also the biggest star. He's also the guy that you can call in to work a regular Friday schedule for SmackDown to try and boost ratings and try and attract intrigue. So there's a balance there. And I don't know if WWE are well equipped to, to finding it and to scoring it and to having Brock on TV in a way that doesn't kind of sully his aura. Um, you know, you could have him run through a lot of guys every single week, but that's going to get old fast. Mm. Modern fans don't like dominant stars, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Ronda Rousey got a lot of backlash for running through opponents. Uh, a lot of people love that. Device of rain, however. Shayna Baszler gets the same in NXT. She murders everyone, yet she gets a lot of backlash from certain cores of the audience. I wonder how Brock is going to be received 
even by the people who claim they hate the part-time schedule. My big issue that I have is is when they bring in these these legends, like they do when they've, they've tried it with Raw a lot recently, you bring them in to try and pop a rating for people saying, oh, look at all these stars we're going to bring back. And I enjoy seeing them, and it's a nice element of nostalgia. And when I say, when I want say like passing the torch I don't mean that they need to then have a match yeah. where someone beats them and they raise their hand and say yeah. this guy's the future but it strikes me that a lot of the time if you were tuning in because you've heard The Rock is going to be on Smackdown on Fox or whatever you need him to be involved with something that isn't just belittling current stars well, you, you said they're pop rating and that's what that does it doesn't build an audience I'm sure WWE if they had to could could get a big rating spike one week if they really built towards it and they thought they were going to do it the whole Austin thing in Madison Square Garden was designed to do that wasn't overly successful but it that's worked, what they were trying yeah. to do building an audience is entirely different because if it's a one-off thing if it's a special attraction you need to make sure that special attraction shows you why you should come back next week even when they're not there and as you say simply raising someone's arm in the ring is not enough. Like they literally, that was literally their strategy to get Roman Reigns over <laughs> in that Royal Rumble. It'll be yeah. fine. They'll hate it, but we'll get The Rock to put him over by raising we'll his hand. That image, won't we? Yeah. It yeah. didn't work at all. People were like, "Well, no, because The Rock's just we like The Rock, and yeah, this is good." But he's just gonna look at this exact picture. He's just gonna leave he's that. He's not gonna be there on Raw tomorrow night. It's still just gonna be Roman Reigns. We're like, "Yeah, I've won me versus Brock, guys." And it's just <laughs> the problem as well with when you get. You know, these big stars like Brock, it's fine, all, all well and good having a big star dominate and run through people, but you always have to build towards their unlikely defeat at some point. And what WWE has spectacularly failed to do for years now is they get the two thirds, they get all that build up perfect. They build somebody up to be the, this unbeatable monster, then they get the underdog victory, and then they don't know what to do with the underdog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the several. Pro, there's quite a lot to unpack with that. Like it, it's a great talking point. Like the underdog victory as well often comes off really flat because it's always a roll up and it's he got lucky and he's the guy who one's running around like a bell end, hands in the air looking all comical and the heels like what happened. That's what they're going to they're going to do that with Cedric Alexander yep. and the United States title at some point and it's not going to get over because they've executed it so poorly. But even like Kofi, Seth, and Becky, three massive fairly underdog victories at the at WrestleMania. Great feel-good moments. We couldn't believe they gave us all three of those yeah. on the night. We literally sat down and went, well, pick two. That best case scenario, you need to have Becky, Seth, or Kofi. You can pick two of them. We couldn't believe we got to leave yeah. with all three of those moments. We're like, look, how great is it? We just get given what we want. And all three of them have had really underwhelming runs since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kofi especially. Um, to kind of backpedal a little bit over to the, the point regarding the legends, I think that part of the problem with them is that, like you guys said, when they show up, they just kind of take heat away around and give mm -hmm. it back. But at the same time, you could kind of tolerate that maybe if they were doing something interesting when mm. they showed up. But no, it's this guy's going to be a contract signing guy. This guy's going to do a promo and then this and that. It's just really boring. And, you know, the Austin thing, it's like they got a nice little number for the Raw anniversary thing when you get the beer bash and all that stuff. Mm. But then you bring it back from Madison Square Garden and it's like, how do I feel nostalgic for a guy I saw three weeks ago? <laughs> it's just kind of silly. They, yeah, they absolutely need to focus less on these little pops, which is what they're going to get with the anniversary of the first episode, the draft, and sustaining it. One thing I was going to ask you about um, when it comes to that, like I said, there's going to be this draft. Where we're assuming it's going to be made pretty much into the A show, not only in terms of uh, commentary teams, mm -hmm. but also stars being uh, shifted over to the blue brand. Friday nights... How will that change stuff? Obviously, they're on a different network, which is a, a bigger audience. But how does shifting from Tuesdays to Fridays affect things? It's You're asking for quite a big wholesale change in your viewing habits, in your viewers' habits, because people are used to sitting down on Monday and Tuesday and watching yeah. their wrestling and, and just creating a way. It, it's ruined our schedule. It has, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be all over the place. Ah. Hope you like working Saturdays, brothers. Um but at the same time as well, they've moved into this, you know, everyone's heard of the Friday night death slot, the grave slot, whatever. People are out socializing, having drinks, seeing their friends and all this stuff, not necessarily sat glued to a TV show. That actually works in their favor to an extent because you have that caveat again to apply and say, well, it's not done as well as we hoped, but it's a Friday night and people are being social because it's Friday rather than sitting in their home watching wrestling but again it's a problem it's a good opportunity though when you think about it because nobody really books TV that they're expecting to get a live audience for in that slot it's part of the, the whole way the catch up market mm. works so right now you wouldn't say they've got a major competitor on that slot so if you're going to stay in you're probably going to end up watching that I think would be their hope I will say that staying in on a Friday night to watch WWE was genuinely one of my favourite parts of growing up when it was on Sky Sports at 10pm however I was like 10 then. <laughs> yes. I had nothing to do on a Friday night but stay in and ask if I could stay up a little late. 
We'll just come in and watch it half cut now. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the, the intriguing thing there, we talked about Friday nights and what have you, and, and you know, do you know what, that was what I was going to ask before I get on to this point. Does the, the three odd million thing account for DVR numbers, or is that what they want? Minimum live viewing. I believe it's minimum live viewing as things are calculated. Now. Okay. Um, so let's go worst case scenario here. They do a they settle down into a two point five. That is not the worst case scenario, well, yes. by the way. If WWE think that's the worst case scenario, <laughs> they need to have a serious rethink. Well, let's go one point nine. <laughs> yes. Uh, what happens? Could Fox cancel the deal? How does it work from there? Yeah, absolutely. Fox can absolutely cancel the deal. Um, but it's just like any other TV show. However, I would suggest that WWE will probably get a bit more rope. So Fox might try other things. They might try marketing it other ways. They will maybe try putting adverts here and there. Mm. They might even do as USA have been doing, interfering a little bit with the creative and offering their own ideas. We all heard about the how the wild card rule was yep. apparently a compromise between Vince and USA because USA were like, hey, these ratings are crap, but guess what? We're going to renew with you anyway. Um, they could absolutely cancel it. I do think it'll take something pretty drastic for that to happen, but it, it could happen. Oh, could, could it be ratcheted down? I.e., could it be, okay, you, you know, we all promised a billion or 1.2 billion or whatever it is for three, for three point whatever million viewers. If you get 2.5, we'll give you 750 million. How, it's, is that, was that possible? It, uh, it, it's kind of a, it's a tough one. It's impossible to ask really without being privy to the details mm, yeah. of the contract. Um, but you know, it's something they might consider if mm. it's legally if that option is legally available to them. I think it's something they would look at and go, well, compromise, bang. I will say it's been a theory that's done the rounds on Reddit numerous times. Is we all sort of thought that Paul Heyman was a great acquisition for all, but Bischoff was a real out of nowhere signing for SmackDown. Big name, obviously, good history, great pedigree of running these shows, but recent times, the guy's a podcast host. Yeah. And we had him on a speaking tour like two years ago. He wasn't certainly wasn't someone with his finger on the pulse of the industry. It has been suggested numerous times that WWE got Bischoff in because he's a big name that Fox will have heard of, but he's very easily sackable if things don't go wrong. Like, well, yeah, all right, we'll take all this on board. We've got this idiot in a leather jacket that's been <laughs> running things. We'll get rid of him for you. That, and then, is that okay? We'll get, we'll, we'll, he, heads, heads will roll, we promise. And it'll be his head, and then we'll do everything you ask. He might just be a bit of a buffer between them and Fox. If it works well, great. If it doesn't, they can blame him yeah. and then try something else. Yeah. I'll Finally, uh, but a bit more of a subjective take now. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Um, I think the the most likely outcome is that SmackDown airs on Fox. The first few episodes are huge. It runs out of steam. It Four tapers million. off. Four million? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, like, I, I'll be a bit more conservative and say three and a half, maybe. First episode, three and a half, maybe second three. Tapers off. I think it'll settle in around 2.6, 2.7, and it'll be fine. Um, but there will be constant rumblings of... Fox. I think the closer it comes to that magic three million number, the more stories you're going to get about things getting changed last minute problems. I think they'll be in a wild panic if they're not quite hitting that. I do think, I think that first one on, on the first, when it first goes there, I genuinely think that could pop a four or five million. Mm, okay. I think they'll get so many people who've never watched rest. Everyone who watches Smackdown will watch it. And they'll get so many people who haven't watched it in years coming back to watch it. And so many people who probably never watched it before watching it. If that episode is good, if it's really, really good, and I don't just mean like the rock is on it. I mean, if there's genuine stuff there, mm -hmm. for people to get their teeth into, sky's the limit. But that's the whole reason why Fox have bought it is for this potential. Personally, I think they'll do more than they do on USA, but mm -hmm. I don't think they'll hit this number. Couldn't Vince just buy a load of tellies? <laughs> well, like Tony Khan yeah. and AEW tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Strikes me as the kind of thing we do, doesn't it? One slightly worrying thing about all of this is that if it doesn't do too well and Fox School, you need to change something, I wonder if it might see you know Vince taking back his old hands on roll and going, I'll fix this myself, yeah. pal. Well, like when he, that was the thing that flashed into my head. Yeah. If he said, well, we got rid of Bischoff. But uh, you remember Mince, Mr. McMahon? Yeah, he's coming back. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> well, you've got to remember that if you're an outsider to wrestling, like you probably didn't think Vince McMahon really owned WWE, <laughs> yeah. did you? You thought he was like, a bit of a character. Now he's hardly on TV. Very probably very easy to convince Fox that he doesn't actually work for the. Oh, we'll get we'll get this on-screen personality back. We'll get him behind the scenes. He knew quite a bit. He was yeah. good back in the day. He was day. knocking about backstage. I seem to remember. Yeah. 
Oh God! It just that, <laughs> that could well happen because, like, remember they did the Vince McMahon exploding limo angle. He had bloody investors phoning up, going, "Hey, is he dead? What's going on?" Didn't like, Trump apparently phone Vince to see if he was okay? Sounds about right. That's the story. Trump apparently <laughs> rang Madness. Vince to check he was okay because he'd seen that his car had blown up. Yeah, well known for his intelligence, of course. Well, let's wrap up there quickly. Um, let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And you can subscribe to What Cult Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from for daily wrestling podcasts. Plus, let us know your thoughts on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and watch their follow three of us. You can follow Andy Murray at Andy H. Murray. The H stands for Haku, father of the worst wrestler in the world and Camacho. <laughs> you can follow Adam Cleary at Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y. Nothing stands for anything. <laughs> you can follow me at Adam Will Warner. As I said, follow us all at WhatCultureWWE. This has been Get the Table. My thanks to Adam and to Andy. Thank you for watching and we will see you soon. <laughs>